All right, you should be able to see my screen now. Yeah. Uh, well, I see a white piece of canvas. <laughs> it's distinctly sharing something. So this is Free Software Game Restoration 2. I gave this talk at the Lieber Planet this year. Uh, if you saw sharing. <laughs> if that was intentional, that's fine. Uh, I haven't stopped sharing. Is anyone else? There we go. Now I've got a slide. <laughs> so this was a talk I gave at Lieber Planet this year. Uh, if you went to the talk, this is the same thing. So uh, the only way you get anything new out of it is if uh, you ask questions. So as I said, this is free software game re restoration two. Uh, I did the original free software game restoration at a uh, previous Libra Planet. Uh, at that one, I covered four different games. Uh, Ostrich Riders, which is a Joust clone. Uh, Shippy 1984, which is a Space Invaders Galaga type game. Uh, Open Alchemist, which looks kind of like Tetris, but instead you're combining uh, elements together to make new elements, but still trying to keep it from going up above the line and uh, ending your game. And uh, Mojotron is a 20, uh, Robotron 2084 clone. Uh, the link to the recording of this was in the emails about this meeting. So if you want to go back and see that at some point, you can. It looks like Sharon yeah. failed again. Oh, there you go. So I am a game developer and a free software developer. Um, I, these are some of the games I've created. So you've got on the bottom, there's Troll Bridge, which is a Legend of Zelda-like game. Uh, BT Builder which is an open source implementation of the Bard's Tale construction set. Uh, the next one is the Pinball Disc Room, which I made for the Disc Room Game Jam. Several people agree with me that the screen share has disappeared again. I refreshed and didn't get it back. <laughs> okay. Um, Here we go. It's back. OK, well, I, I'm not sure that there's much I can do about that. Uh, up above is the shallow stone uh, solar, which is a game I made for the seven day roguelike challenge. And then you've got uh, three small games there, which were designed for the Pocket Arcade or the Tiny Arcade, which has a screen about the size of your thumb. So it's only 96 pixels by 64 pixels. And so you've got uh, Viobyte, which is a Pac-Man-like game. You've got uh, Color Monsters, which is a Pokemon-like game but you also paint your creature. And you've got uh, Mutant Road, which is a beat-em-up. But as I said, I like to try out a lot of different games. And over time, I find some that are broken, and I end up fixing them up. Uh, there are some things that are not being covered in this. Uh, emulators are great. Uh, they allow you to play games that you can't get anymore or uh, you're for whatever run anymore. 
So for example, on here, there's a picture of Robotron 2084 running for, for the uh, Atari 7800. I have an Atari 7800 and I have Robotron 2084 for it. However, I do not have the cables to actually hook it up. Those have been lost at some point. So the only way I can go over and play that particular version at the moment is to run it under an emulator. Uh, next to it, you have one of the Mega Man games, which is another game that I like to play and have for the uh, Nintendo. But again, my Nintendo is currently not working either. I'm also not covering rewritten engines. So on here, you have a uh, Tomb Raider running under an open source engine. And uh, the master, the original master of Orion. Now, emulators and rewritten engines are great, but the problem with them is that you lose some of the features of free software or open source. Uh, you can't easily modify them. In the case of a rewritten engine, you can do modifications, but there are some restrictions there. So for example, if I were to go over and create a new weapon for Tomb Raider, I could create the model, I could insert all the code in the game in order to uh, implement the new weapon. And I could go over and modify a level to give you that weapon. That modified level is using the original game level and so I can't distribute it. I don't have the rights to do that. Now, you can go over and get around this. Uh, it was done in the Doom community for a long time where you needed to have a complete uh, WAD file. And so what they would do is you would ship only your changes and then you would run a program to copy over all the base Doom content to make it so that it actually works. But it's not exactly convenient. Uh, you still have to have an original copy of the game in order to actually be able to run it. So if I wanted one of my friends to check out my modification to Tomb Raider, unless he had Tomb Raider, he wouldn't be able to play it. So now we'll get into the games that I am going to be covering. Uh, so the first one is Seahorse Adventures. It is a platformer, so like Super Mario Brothers. Uh, it was written for Python 2. Uh, because of that, when Fedora was removing uh, Python 2 and trying to move as much as possible to Python 3. Uh, Seahorse Adventures was one of the packages that ended up getting removed. Uh, I knew it was going to be removed. I, I had seen the messages about it, but I didn't do anything. And then when I finally upgraded my system to that version of Fedora, it went over and said, it's going to have to remove this package because it's no longer supported. I found that annoying. So even though I didn't play the game very often, uh, it's a pretty good game. And so I didn't want it to just disappear. And so I set about updating it to Python 3. Uh, Python 2 to uh, 3 has a lot of changes. Uh, they do, they broke a lot of uh, code and didn't really support that much backwards compatibility. But the changes were largely just mechanical. So you would find one thing that was wrong and then you would go over and change it everywhere in the code base. 
Uh, I did try to determine at various points if the change was needed. So for example, the division sign uh, switched to doing floating point division. And so before it was uh, doing integer division if you were dividing two integers. And so that caused a lot of problems in the code and you need to use the double division sign in order to get integer division. So I was auditing the code to determine, all right, do I really need integer division here or does it matter? Uh, eventually I came to the conclusion that everything in uh, the Seahorse Adventures is using integer division and it wasn't worth auditing the code to find out because every time I audited it, it was using integers. So I went over and did all these changes and I ended up getting it up and running. And so everything was great. And then I installed it and tried it out again recently. And I found that it did not accept keyboard input. The reason it didn't accept keyboard input is because it was using the is keyword instead of double equals. Is determines if the objects are exactly the same. So if you create an object, you put some numbers in it, and then you create a new object and put the same numbers in it, they will actually not evaluate as equal if you use the is because you created them separately. Uh, at one point, key down uh, would be, eval they, they would give you the actual same object. At some point they changed that. So suddenly it could no longer uh, determine that that's the event type that was being sent. Uh, this is a problem with Python. Uh, they go over and don't have strong guarantees about backwards compatibility. Uh, with most of my C++ programs, it doesn't matter how long ago they were written, they still compile now and run. Uh, it doesn't mean that Python is a bad language to use, but you just got to keep in mind that there is a ongoing maintenance that you may need if you're going to be using Python. Uh, for the next game, uh, there's a game called Thrust that was made for the Commodore 64. In this game, you are going down to a planet and picking up this really heavy ball. And because of the weight of it, it adjusts how your ship moves. And so it, it's like it's on a pendulum. And it's a it's very much you're trying to control the the physics of your ship in order to get out of this uh, maze that you're in. I've never played the original game. Uh, I went over and played this when I first got into Linux. It was one of the games I found uh, at that time. My computer could not run X Windows very well. Uh, instead, I mostly just left it in console. And so for graphic games, I used what was called uh, SVGA lib, which allowed you to use graphics, but you did have to run the program as root. So I looked, I happened to look for this recently and found it. Uh, the he no longer has just SVGA lib support. He also added in X Windows support at some point. The X Windows support only supports pseudo color. So if you're not familiar with what pseudo color is, uh, back in the early days of Linux, 
Uh, a lot of computers could not have as many colors as we have today. Instead, they could only have like 256 colors on the screen at one time. So you would go over and you'd run a program and it would ask X Windows to say, hey, I need this many colors or, or these colors. And X Windows could come back and say, nope, sorry, the, the palette's full. There's, you can't get that color. So what they introduced to deal with this was this pseudo color mode where X windows would have a palette for everything except for this one window that's running in pseudo color. That particular window has its own palette. When you are not in that window, the colors in that window look all weird. When you make that window active, all the colors on the rest of X windows go all crazy. Dennis, can I interrupt just a second? Sure. You keep uh, you keep going uh, out and back in. Uh, you keep having a connection lost, and then you, then a connection good. Uh, I don't know if it's your physical connection. I'm wondering if you could log out and log back in. Sure. Can you try that? Yep. Uh -uh. All right, let me start sharing again. Looks like you're sharing your whole screen and not just the window. That may be part of the problem. I could share just the screen if you'd like. It looks like that's what you're already doing. Well, I, I was sharing the whole uh screen and just i can try sharing just the one window yeah give that a try okay all right so you're seeing me again uh, yep. Looks good. All right. So uh, the pseudo color mode of uh, X windows is pretty awful. Uh, as it happens, you can no longer use it. You can only use it if you are on one of these displays that have only 256 colors. And so this game could not run. Now there is a web-based remake that I found called uh, Thrust 30. It has its own graphics that they've made. Uh, the levels are not released as open source, uh, but it looks really nice. Uh, I actually, when I was making this presentation, I went over and thought maybe I should go get a screenshot of it. And so I went over to the website and it happened to not be working that at that moment, which is one of the reasons why I'm not particularly fond of web-based programs. You're at the mercy of the internet as to whether that person has decided to just remove it entirely or if it happens to be down that day or whatever. So I, I much prefer to have local programs. I just got to interrupt again. Um... Your screen didn't stay up for very long. I'm wondering how you're presenting it. Uh, and it's back. Because we've uh, we've had problems in the past with people when they were um, 
when, when we were running like uh, LibreOffice in uh, slideshow mode, it would uh, it wouldn't be reliable. But when I just uh, put it in the, the editor mode and uh, click through the slides, uh, okay, in that, I can do it, that. I I am using the slideshow mode. Now we've seen a lot of problems with that in the past with the, with the slideshow mode. So try just play, doing it in the uh, editor uh, editor that's, mode. That's passing weird, but <laughs> if we've seen it, we've seen it. Yeah. Okay, now ho hopefully it'll uh, be stable this time. So it'll <laughs> drop down. Okay, so uh, I worked on modernizing it. So if you see the graphics of the uh, the ship and everything, I, I fixed. I changed the graphics. I changed it to use SDL two uh, because that's generally the back end that I like to use. Uh, SDL is very uh, stable. And so I, I tend to use it for most of my games. Uh, the My original plan was to keep the all the different backends that the uh, original program supported. However, it was using autoconf and no amount of fiddling with it uh, allowed me to get it working. So finally I gave up on it and replaced it with CMake. And because of that, all the other backends were removed. Uh, now I mentioned that if you had noticed on the slide for uh, the Seahorse Adventures, I had mentioned the lack of visibility as a problem with Seahorse Ventures. And so one of the things I've been doing is creating a, a open source achievement system. So most modern platforms for games have achievements. They tell you how you've progressed in the game and they typically also have achievements for funny things to do in the game. And so these are all owned by whatever company is distributing the game typically. So Sony has its platform, Microsoft has its own platform, and then Steam has its own platform. And sometimes people won't play games that are on a different platform that doesn't support achievements because they like the achievements. And open source games haven't had the ability to do that. And so I felt that they've been losing out to some degree. So I created an achievement system. I've added it, I've added support to this version of the game and to Seahorse Adventures. Um, now I will say that uh, putting the graphics into this game was a lot more difficult than I thought. Uh, when I initially went over and did it, the spaceship started colliding with stars. And laser blasts started going through things. I eventually determined that, unknown to me, there was some game logic encoded in the graphics. So a laser blast would only hit uh, things that have a pixel value that was either greater or lower than the uh, pixel value for the laser. And the same with your ship. So because I had altered the palette, all of a sudden the ship palette was above where the star was, and you start suddenly running into the stars. It, it was a little annoying to have to fix, but uh, eventually I got it up and running so that it will no longer do that. Now, one of my reasons for replacing the graphics in this was that I feel that clones should have their own identity. 
they they shouldn't trade off of the identity of the original game and so they should have their own name uh, so i didn't want to use thrust for the name i wanted something to, for its own and so i replaced the graphics for that as well uh, for the new name i picked inertia blast my original plan was to just erase the uh, thrust logo from the title screen and put on inertia blast. And I found that that had a problem. I happened to look at someone play uh, a play of the original game. And I noticed that the title screen of the original game looked exactly like that. So since I don't want to be using the copyrighted title screen of the original game, I need to make a new one. As I am not an artist, I went over and built a ship out of Legos using a digital designer. Uh, I modified the ship a little bit after generating it, but that's what I put in on the title screen. The pod that you're picking up is also built out of Legos. Although in that case, it's not possible to physically build that one. Uh, that one has the, the Lego pieces overlapping. So uh, it's something you could do in the digital version, but not with real Legos. The tractor beam and the engine thrust on there are both from a site called opengameart.org. And so that ends up uh, bringing up Inertia Blast. I even went over and submitted it to uh, Fedora. So it's now available from the package manager there. Now, this next game, Mari Zero, is a game I had heard about a long time ago. And I have never, I never tried playing it. Uh, the reason for that is that I tend to stay away from games that are blatant copyright infringements. So this particular game was uh, reusing graphics and level design and everything from Super Mario Brothers. Now, the game has new features in it. They, they added in a portal gun uh, so that you can open portals and travel through them to other areas. And when I did try it recently, I was amazed at what you can do with the portal gun and the possibilities with it. Uh, in particular, the designer of this created his own portal levels that uh, really took advantage of the portal gun to do little puzzles where you'd have to figure out how to use a portal to put like a block in a particular place to activate the uh, the door to open up. And so I really liked that, but you have these levels that no one's going to be able to put into Fedora, for example, and all the graphics are, are you're not able to use. And so I decided to see about fixing that and so I could uh, distribute the game. Now that's, Part of the problem that you run into when you do this is the problem of GitHub. Uh, GitHub and GitLab, the, those sites are great. Uh, the, the problem with them though, is that people will go over and find a project they like and they will click the button to fork it. And usually that's all they do. But then occasionally you have people that put in a change or two 
And then occasionally you have people that put in lots of changes. And so you end up in this situation of wondering, all right, what code base should I start with? So in the case of Mari Zero, there is a official Mari Zero GitHub uh, account. In addition, there are all these other Mari Zeros. Uh, Mari Zero AE is a version that the uh, someone in the community has made lots and lots of changes to. So it adds in a lot of features of later versions of Super Mario Brothers. Uh, the Mari Zero SE is the special edition that the original designer was working on. He released some betas of it, but he didn't finish it and eventually decided he wasn't going to. So it was just released out there. Um, some features in it are broken. So Mari Zero CE is the community edition. They took the Mari Zero special edition and tried to fix all the bugs and add new features in beyond that. And then you have Mari Zero Two, which is a new game based off of Super Mario Brothers 3. And it was created by the original creator of Mari Zero, but has kind of stalled and doesn't seem to be in development anymore. So you have all these big changed versions. You have all of the little forks that people have created. So you have to decide at some point what you're going to start with. Now, I decided to start with the original Mari Zero. That's mainly because of the fact that that has the least content in it. If I have to replace all of the graphics, uh, starting with something that has the least amount of graphics is a lot easier than going over and finding something that has an enormous amount of graphics. So for replacements, uh, I mentioned before this opengameart.org. Uh, it's a great site. They have all sorts of artwork that you can use in your game. In most cases, the artwork needed to be modified some to be able to work with uh, Mari Zero. So for example, the Empress here was used to replace Princess Peach, but it was bigger than the, Emper the Princess Peach, Peach uh, sprite. So I had to tweak it down to a smaller size. Now, some of them were great. So this Cannon Bob was a perfect replacement for Bullet Bill. Uh, in some cases, I created new artwork. So the Hammer Brothers needed some new artwork. Uh, this is the new artwork for the Spiny. And you have other some other artwork down here for like the backgrounds and stuff, lava. Uh, you've got this potion replaces the fire flower. Now, in the case of the player, I had a different problem. Uh, the Mari Zero supports up to four players simultaneous. The way they do this is they have four different layers for the sprite. Uh, one of them has the portal gun. Uh, and then the other layers have the three colors of Mario. So the way they do this in the uh, UI, you can go over and specify what each of those three colors are for your particular player. So each player can have different colors. So for this original graphic that I had, they had 
way too many colors. Uh, if I wanted to go over and create a UI to specify the colors, I would need a lot more options. So I reduced it down to a smaller number of colors. It does have more than three because you see a little bit of white for the uh, shirt and a little bit of red for the tie. So those particular colors happen, I happen to put on the same uh, sprite sheet as the portal gun. So every single player character has a red tie and a white shirt. But otherwise the colors can be customized so that you can distinguish the different characters. Now I will say down here that I am not a artist. And so this replacement I did for uh, Bowser is really ugly. I, I don't like it, but it works for now and it can always be cleaned up later. So that's what I've gone with. Now I didn't just update the graphics. I, I did do a little bit of work in the code itself. Uh, the original version of this game had no full screen support. So I added in a full screen mode. Uh, they did the original version had only the copyright of the original creator because everything in the game was either his creation or taken from Nintendo's Super Mario Brothers. Uh, since I now had a whole bunch of different people that I had used some of their artworks from or some of their sounds from, uh, I needed some way to be able to credit their contributions. So I created a credit screen. I changed it so that when you switch into the uh, Fire Mario mode, uh, you keep your skin color. In the original Mario Zero, when you got the Fire Flower, you turned into the exact same color. So if two people had the Fire Flower, there was no way to distinguish them. At least not by color. Uh, the game does have the ability to put different hats on the characters. So if you had the foresight to do that, you could tell your characters apart, but otherwise you would not be able to. Now, keeping just your skin color doesn't make it easy to tell who you are. It, it makes it a little bit better than it was, but it's still not a great solution. I also added in a mode for uh, no portal gun. Uh, you might think that's kind of weird since I said part of the reason I liked this game was that the portal gun allowed you to do so many interesting things. Uh, but the reason for having a no portal gun mode is that then it becomes possible to put it on the arcade machine that I have. Uh, the portal gun uses the mouse to uh, direct where you're going to uh, open the portal. Uh, if you're using a controller, it uses the second analog stick. And in the case of the arcade machine I have, I don't have a second a joystick to use. So the, having a no portal gun mode allows me to put it on there. I'm still working on new levels for the game. So there's only one level that I've created. And I have rebranded the game Gateway Jump. Uh, part of the reason for putting jump in there is that uh, on the original Donkey Kong, uh, Mario actually was named Jumpman. So I thought it'd be fun to put that in the name if I could.
Now, this next game is actually a commercial game. Uh, it was released on Steam. It's called Bite Path. It's a replayable arcade shooter. Uh, basically, as you play the game, you can unlock more abilities. And it's got this massive skill tree so that you can play it for a long time and keep unlocking more and more abilities. So it's great. You can just go over and purchase it from Steam, download it, and then start playing. Except you can't. Uh, if you try to play it from Steam, it will not run uh, because the what the uh, developer did was he used the Love 2D engine. And for the Linux version, he just gave you the uh, love file. And so you have to get the Love 2D engine yourself and then run it on this file in order to start it up. And so if you do that with the uh, version from Steam, you generally get a white screen. Uh, this is because if you are getting the latest version of Love, that's version 11, and the version that BytePath was written for was 0 0.10.2. Now, really, there's not a huge amount of difference between those two because version 11 was the version after 10.2. Uh, but they, they got rid of the zero point for whatever reason. Uh, the reason that most things end up being white is because the 0 0.10.2 used a scale of 0 to 255 for colors. And version 11 uses a scale from 0 to 1. So unless you happen to be have like black, where everything is 0, if you're using anything else, most of the time it ends up being all white. Uh, there were some other problems. Uh, they changed how input events were. They, they added some new input events. And so when the game saw these input events that it didn't know about, it just crashed. There was some minor changes for the way music is handled. But that was pretty easy to change. I did disable Steam support, uh, but then went over and added in achievements using my open source achievement system. And so now that game is playable again. <laughs> so those are the four games that I uh, have been playing around with relatively recently. Uh, I have a website that I post updates about games that I'm working on and stuff. Uh, I typically do a open game source article on games that I modify. Uh, I can be found on the free game dev forums. Also my email address and my Mastodon uh, social network. Hey, well, thanks, uh, Dennis. Thank you. So does anyone have any questions? Well, apparently not. Hmm. I, I see uh, 
Brandon Vogel went over and commented on the number of uh, repos for uh, Mari Zero. And yeah, there's a lot. <laughs> so do you do all of your development from a Fedora box or do you develop from different OSs usually? I usually do everything from Fedora. Uh, sometimes I'll go over and run a different distribution in a VM if someone says that there's a problem. Uh, but usually I, I look at it as a, if it runs under Fedora, it probably runs under everything else. That's fair. Uh, what, one thing I have found recently was I did try to make some binaries that could run on any distribution. And so I went over and tested it out on a bunch of different distributions. And I had used the first version of Fedora that I had introduced my achievement system on so that I had that library. And I could not get it to run on Debian because of that. The Debian had an older version of the C library. And so the binaries I produced on uh, the whatever Fedora version it was, I think it was version 32, was too recent and would fail to uh, use the C library on Debian. Th there is definitely an advantage to flat pack for distributing games. But so Dennis, you think you can send us a copy of your slide so so we can post it on the blue website? Sure. Okay, can you just address address that to Jabber at blue.org? Yeah, I'll put that in the chat window. Whoops. I got a typo there. <laughs> yeah, that's more like it. I will do that. I'm not seeing anyone else asking questions. I what I was asked at the uh, Libra Planet which one was the hardest game that I've worked on. And I said there were two that I, I consider really hard. Uh, one of them was Thrust because of that weird setup with the graphics where I, I changed things and suddenly I was running into things and the lasers weren't working. Mm -hmm. uh, but that was a coding issue and the other one is Mari Zero, simply because there is so much artwork and so much levels that need to be replaced in order to uh, make it distributable. So one question that may, may have a very quick or may not have a very quick answer. What, what program do you generally use to edit static artwork on, on your machines? Uh, I use the GIMP uh, almost all the time. That, that's mostly what I use. Uh, for I, I did happen to use uh, Inkscape for uh, for the changes I did for Rust. Uh, the reason that I used Inkscape in that case was because 
I could get a, a I could do the lines better. And then I exported it and turned it into a uh, ping file. Cool, thanks. I, I do really like the GIMP. Uh, it's not a easy program to use, but it's very powerful. You know, we haven't had a talk on the GIMP in, uh, I don't know how many years now. I have to check the website for that. Probably be a good idea to uh, have another talk on that uh, in the near future. Hey, can you recommend any uh, good speakers for that? We had some uh, very good speakers early on, but you're, you're talking maybe 10 years ago or so. Yeah, probably more than that. I, I know I'm not a good person for that. <laughs> I, I use a minimal set of features under uh, the GIMP. <laughs> it allows me to do some bad pixel art. Mm -hmm. Trying to remember that guy's name. Yeah, I think we can probably find somebody with GIMP that has, uh, can talk about GIMP. Yeah, the last guy was Kerry Bunks. That was back in February of 2000. So that's more than 20 years ago. <laughs> I'm sure there's been a lot of changes since then. Oh, the description doesn't have a Live yet. streaming is on. November. On the web page. Okay, that's Christoph Darbeck, uh, uh, OSS Digital Photography Workflow. That was the one in 2015. That looks like the Carrie Bucks uh, talk back in uh, February 2000 was the last one specifically about you. Know, in fact, the only one the way we did on GIMP. Yeah, I mean, you could uh, probably send him some email and see if he's still around, still active in GIMP. I remember before that, he did a talk on Scilab. I think it was another graphics package. Yeah, he did talk on Scilab in 1996. OK, 
Okay, I'll see if uh, see if he's still around. Actually, given what we went through with COVID, uh, don't really know if he's still alive at this point. There's so many people lost through that. Well, I mean, you know, you're talking about 25 years ago, so you never know, you know, who's around for 25 years ago. It's like a whole different world now. Okay. Well, it seems like uh, we've pretty much run out of steam here. Dennis, Dennis, thank you very much. Really appreciate it. Yeah, thanks, Dennis. Too bad it was unfortunate that you kept fading out. I think it was something with the connection to your ISP or something like that. Or you That's where they. It's where they didn't disconnect you, but it kept uh, kept losing the de uh, desktop sharing. And the little uh, icon in the corner of your uh, the uh, of the thumbnail of you still said uh, screen sharing was on. So it's kind of bizarre. I don't think I've ever seen that particular behavior before. Dennis, you're muted. <laughs> I realize that. Uh, did it work all right after I switched to just doing uh, the presentation uh, in no. LibreOffice or? No, no, I, soon I, that too. I, I think it had to do with your connection. Uh, if, you, if you share your whole screen, of course, you're using a lot more bandwidth, but uh, I, I think it was more something with your Wi-Fi or your uh, connection. Well, I'm not using Wi-Fi. I, I specifically okay. hard line in for these yeah. sorts of things, but that's too bad. Sorry about that. Well, shit happens. I guess, I, I guess the question is, uh, what, are we, what are we gonna do about next month? Uh, so, uh, Dennis, did you wanna do a talk on Steam Deck or would you rather someone else do it? And. Um, if, if so, is there anyone in particular you might recommend? Um, I, I don't. I don't know. Um, as I said, I don't know anyone who has it. Um, oh yeah. So I, I can talk in general about it, and I, I can talk about what Steam does, and and how you use games and stuff, and that, and talk about how what changes they put in for the Steam Deck, but. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if we can't find anyone to do uh, anything specific about Steam Deck, then that sounds like a, a good start. And maybe you could find someone else to follow up on it in a few months. Once we track down someone who actually has it. What do you think, Gary? I, I think that'll work. Um... Uh, I'll also see if I can get uh, some people to discuss the uh, major packaging managers, uh, App Image, right. Flatpak, and uh, Stoopy D. I'm not sure with that. Not, I yeah I I don't like them. Uh, I I did a talk to the BLU several years ago on them. And, uh, but I've never really used them, and I, I see the value for them, but I don't think they're really as usable as necessary. I just find it annoying that Fedora will go over and default to flat pack sometimes. And so you have to go over and specifically switch it to use the RPM through the software center. That drives me crazy. I never use the software center. Well, I, I use it sometimes. I don't use it a lot, but one of the times I installed, I installed some software from it and it should have had a whole bunch of settings and stuff automatically. And I started it up and it had nothing. 
and I'm just there, did I lose everything? And no, it's just because it was running Flatpak and that uses a different location where it's storing all your data. And so yeah, I had same thing is Snap is the same thing. Snap puts you in a virtual machine. I think Flatpak also does put you in a virtual machine and you have to do some things to actually point that virtual machine back to your home directory, hmm. which was what Jill's problem was with Snap. Yep. And Thunderbird. It sounds like it would be a useful discussion topic. Yeah, I'd like, yeah, so I'm looking, I, I think that uh, Dick is supposed to talk to Mike Cornelson, who, uh, but he's out in Germany, but uh, he's pretty good on app image and he doesn't like the other two. So I, I need someone that really knows uh, Flatpak pretty well and um, Snap. We at one time had a speaker from uh, Ubuntu, who came to us, said he wanted to talk about Snap, but then he never showed up. Apparently, uh, he might have gotten let go from um, Canonical or something around that time. Hmm. Okay. Well, I guess we can call it a night now. Okay, we'll continue to look for speakers for next time. I'm still looking for somebody in the COBOL, and it's the guy I was talking to is Bruce Borland. Dennis, you know him. But Bruce is not really all that literate in the later versions of COBOL. Hmm. Yep. I could dig out my 1401 manual. That new? Oh, that used copy of a 1401 manual that I picked up cheap from a used book bin got two girlfriends through the survey of programming languages. That was, I think, my first assembler. The, the, the core definition of uh, COBOL didn't change. Well, I, I went over and tried to use the latest version of C++ for that uh, shallow stone uh, solar game that I made. And so in particular, I was using the new modules of C++, uh, which when I was using that, CMake failed because it doesn't support modules yet. So I resorted to making my own make file. That's fine. I could deal with that. I got to the second day when GCC uh, failed with an internal error. And I'm just there, well, I, I guess I'm done with this experiment. I need to go back to header files. <laughs> yes. Header files are good. They work. Yeah, but there's a lot of newer technologies in C++ that I haven't used. So I was looking at it as I can go over and experiment with all these things with this new project that I don't have any legacy stuff to deal with. It, it didn't turn out that way. Well, sometimes that's the way it works. Yeah. My reaction to the committee making C++ bigger has not been favorable. I, I've liked their changes. It allows me to get rid of a lot of stuff that I use from Boost. Well, uh, the first round of uh, changes uh, bit me hard, but that was a long time ago. Well, it sounds like you have a plague of locusts there behind you. Oh, me? 
Well, maybe that was someone else. I was hearing it, so it wasn't me. That, that's probably me. My uh, fan on my laptop is very loud. Oh, okay. Hmm. All right. Well, thanks, Dennis. Um, I guess, uh, I guess we can close everything down now. Unless someone else has anything else you want to talk about? No. Okay. Well, good night, everyone. Catch you later. Good night. Good night.